everyone, and welcome to Unit 7, Module 36. We're talking about thinking and language today. Here are your learning objectives, and here are your vocab. So language is our spoken, written, or signed words, and the ways we combine them to communicate meaning. Basically, me dumping out all these thoughts right now into your brain via language. Thanks very much. So if we break down language into all of its pieces, there's a couple of vocab you need to know related to this. So phonemes are the smallest distinctive sound units in a language. So phonemes and morphemes, people get confused. And we're going to practice these in class. But phonemes, you want to focus on sound. So in the word bat, you have b, a, t. There's three phonemes. The word chat also has three phonemes because you're not just breaking it down by letter, you're breaking it down by sound, not by letter. So ch, at, there's still, there's three sounds. The ch make one sound. Morphemes are the smallest units that carry meaning in a language. So the smallest you can break down the word bat and still have it have meaning is bat. Can't break it down anymore. So there's one morpheme in the word bat. In the word preview, there are two morphemes because you can break that down into pre and view. So if it has meaning, it can be broken and it counts as a morpheme. Grammar is the system of rules that enable us to communicate in a way that's understandable. So within grammar, there's a bunch of different vocab. The two that you need to know are semantics and syntax. So semantics are a set of rules that give meaning to what we're saying. And syntax is the set of rules for combining the words into grammatically correct sentences. For example, colorless green ideas sleep furiously has correct syntax. It's put in grammatically correct formation. However, it doesn't mean anything, so it doesn't have the semantics. Me and him are going to the store has semantics, you know what it means, but it's not correct syntax, it's not grammatically correct. Language development, so starting around four months old, you'll start to hear a baby making vocalizations. So ooh, ah, goo goo, all those kind of sounds, like they're not related to um, their language that they're born into. It's just their first. So at one word stage, um, and this forms at about one to two years old, the child speaks single words, mama, cat, dog, etc. Two word stage, they're starting um, to speak mama, go car, like just putting two things together to get some sort of meaning. And this is occurring by about age two, Telegraphic speech, this is, um, I know my example is two words, so it seems like two word stage, but the difference here is that it's just whatever they're stringing together, and it doesn't have to be two words, although it often is, um, it's more about the idea that it's just nouns and verbs. They're just putting nouns and verbs together. They're not forming a full sentence like a telegram. It's just nouns and verbs. Get to the point. So in language development, there is something that is called a critical period, or some people call it a sensitive period for learning language. So a critical period is a certain time where you have to, you have to learn that language. It's critical. If you don't learn it during that time period, you won't learn it. Whereas a sensitive period is an ideal time to learn something, like a language in this case. And it means that if you don't learn it in that ideal time, you can still learn it, but it's just going to be harder and it's going to take longer. 
and it's just not going to go as smoothly. So the most famous when we're talking about language is Noam Chomsky. He is a famous linguist who kind of discussed this critical, he was really the first one to talk about this critical period. And he also found that we, that language is inborn, like we ha, are predisposed to learn grammar. And he actually said that there is something called universal grammar, because all languages do share basic elements, meaning they all have nouns, adjectives, verbs. Um, we all learn by saying nouns first, no matter what language um, that we are learning. And so he kind of said that this is, we're predisposed to learn language, but also it's critical period. So at a certain time period point, if you don't learn it, then it's not going to happen. So adults have trouble deciphering syllables if they're listening to an unfamiliar language. It's kind of just sounds like a bunch of things thrown together. We can't break apart the sounds into distinctive syllables. But a seven-month-old baby can discern and break things down. And they can, they can even analyze which syllables tend to go together more frequently. So, for example, happy, baby, they hear those together frequently and they start to get an understanding of those things going together. So seven-month-old baby can learn language much better than an adult. After two minutes of a computer speaking an unbroken, monotone string of nonsense syllables, the eight-month-old baby can recognize repeated three-syllable sequences. So they're just more, their brain is wired to do this. But this time period fades. So if you look at this chart in the right, by age seven, there's significant drop off in acquiring a second language. And as an adult, if you learn a second language, you will always speak with an accent from your native language. So the best time to learn a second language is young, because that our brains are equipped for that. All right, so let's talk about damage to the brain and how that affects language. So aphasia is just the word we use for any sort of damage to our ability to communicate. So Broca's area, you'll recall, is the um, part of our brain that is for language expression. So if you had a damaged Broca's area or Broca's aphasia, you'd have trouble speaking words. Maybe you'd speak like the par a part of a word, but not the full word. Um, the person could maybe still sing a familiar song because that's a different part of the brain actually and they can still understand language, they just can't speak it. Whereas Wernicke's area, that's um, language reception. So this person can speak, however, it doesn't really go together and make anything meaningful. So mother is away, her working her work to get her better. Those are, those are words, but the sentence doesn't mean anything. So language also affects how we think. Now, a really extreme view on this is Benjamin Worf's hypothesis called linguistic determinism. And that the idea that language determines the way we think, that's it. Like we are restricted, we can't think outside of our language or beyond our language. We're restricted by it. But a lot of people have problems with this. And just to give you an example, can you think of a shade of blue that you can't give a name for? I'm sure that you can. So we can, we can think of things outside of what we can label or identify. But we are, people do agree that we are influenced by the language we, we know and we think in. So, for example, English has more vocabulary that is um, on self-focused emotions. 
and so that kind of encourages that behavior. And Japan has more language for sympathizing with others. So that encourages that way of thinking. Of course, this is also like culture, but language is culture. So it's all kind of together. Bilingual individuals, this is really interesting. They can reveal different personality profiles depending on which language they are speaking. So again, that kind of speaks to the idea that language does influence us and the way we think because um, they're, they're, they kind of speak differently depending on which language they're using. And they also have what's known as the bilingual advantage. And this is the idea that they are skilled at inhibiting one language while using the other. And that actually shows in research that they ha have they are better able to shut down distractions and kind of focus on what they're trying to attend to and not um, give attention to any sort of distracting thing. So really good executive functioning skills. And that's basically from practicing like the shutting down of one language to use the other one. We also think in visual um, images. So there was there are several examples of how this helps us. There was a pianist who was in prison for seven years during China's Cultural Revolution and soon after released he was touring and he said when he was asked like how can you do that you haven't played for seven years and he said yes I have played I played ev I practiced every single day in my mind. So visualizing, especially for athletes, but really for anyone, and they've done a lot of studies with academics as well, visualizing doing something, the planning or how you would actually do it, improves performance. Not necessarily visualizing like the end results, that can sometimes help you in terms of confidence, I guess, but in terms of being able to perform better, visualizing the act. So the takeaways, remember phonemes, this is a tricky word, phonemes are the smallest sound units that you can break a word down into. Morphemes, the M equals meaning. So it's the smallest meaningful unit of a word. Language has a critical period or a sensitive period. Remember that name, Noam Chomsky, and that at eight, by age seven, there's a big drop off in our ability to acquire a language. Babies learn language better than adults. Linguistic determinism, so the idea that we are limited in the what we can think about based on our language and our language influences the way we think. So it's reciprocal. When you hear the word aphasia to either Broca's or Wernicke's, it means there's damage there. And don't forget that we think in... All right, so that sums up module 36, and I will see you.